what we're doing essentially is looking for new uh, small drug-like molecules that might enhance the ability of uh, the brain to synthesize um, neurons in a region of the brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus, as almost everybody has touched on it in some manner, is the part of the brain that's involved in um, sensory processing and memory formation and basically it facilitates um, our ability to adapt to an ever-changing environment. You have input comes in from the outside through the cerebral cortex, is um, shuttled through this circuit and then sent back out to the cerebral cortex for long-term storage. And the gatekeeper to this whole circuit is this V-shaped region in the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus. And what is really special about this region of the brain is that it continually turns over every um, day of our lives in all species that have been studied thus far. And so there are these uh, stem cells called neural stem cells that live right down here at the base of this structure. And they become activated to replicate. And then these um, cells differentiate into neurons. And the reason that I became interested in this process in the beginning was that I was studying um, a model of schizophrenia, the NPAS3 deficient mouse. Um, NPAS3 is a gene that was shown by David Porteous as well as some other investigators to be disrupted in some patients that have schizophrenia. And when I started my postdoc work at UT Southwestern with Steve McKnight, um, what I did was um, a whole slew of uh, biochemical and molecular biological, biological techniques to figure out what MPAS3 does. And it turns out that one of its major functions in the hippocampus is to control this transition right here between a quiescent cell, which is just sitting there not replicating, and a replicating cell, which then goes on to make new neurons. Once we knew that that's what it did, it was a simple thing to test whether or not the process of neurogenesis might be compromised in NPAS3 deficient mice. And the way to do that is you can label these cells right here with a chemical called BRDU. It's an analog of one of the base pairs of thymidine. And once it's incorporated in the brain, you can dissect the brain and you can look at it under the microscope. And when we did this with NPAS3 knockout mice, we saw that um, there's virtually no, no neurogenesis at all going on in the dentate gyrus of the knockout mouse compared to a normal amount that you see over the course of about two weeks in a wild type mouse. This absence of neurogenesis in the knockout mouse correlates with decreased thickness of the dentate gyrus layer. It's kind of hard to see here. Um, but what I think you can see is this three-dimensional imaging of the hippocampus within um, the brain in the wild type and in the knockout mouse. And so the knockout mouse is missing neurogenesis and its dentate gyrus shown here in purple is substantially smaller than, um, than the size you see in a normal wild type mouse. So from this we propose that hippocampal neurogenesis might be involved in some of the pathophysiological problems that are involved in schizophrenia, particularly the learning deficits associated with the hippocampus. And it was subsequently shown by different investigators um, that uh, postmortem brain tissue from patients with schizophrenia show evidence of decreased hippocampal neurogenesis as well. So our rationale was that if faulty hippocampal neurogenesis is involved in decreased hippocampal functioning in schizophrenia, then if we had drugs that could restore that process, they might be able to be useful for treating schizophrenia. And so therefore, we decided to start a large-scale um, screening program to find small molecules that might facilitate this process. And we did this in living mice, um, which was a, a gargantuanly large project, took um, several years. But we did it in living mice because what we wanted to do was find small molecules that worked selectively and safely in a living organism so that we could shortcut potentially shortcut a lot of the problems associated with other um, screening programs and test tubes where you don't always find that it translates into working in the intact animal. So we started with uh, 1,000 compounds that were considered to be representative of the larger comp compound library at UT Southwestern, which is about 250,000 small molecules. And we grouped those 1,000 molecules into pools of 10 just randomly. And we infused them over the course of seven days into the brains of regular wild type mice. And we infused them by implanting a cannula, which is like a straw, right into the um, lateral ventricle of the brain. And we hooked that cannula up to a pump, which we implant right here underneath the back um, skin of the mouse. And over the course of the next seven days, the contents of the pump are delivered steadily into the brain. And we label the cells that are being made during that time by injecting them with BRDU. We chose a seven-day period of time because there's really two targets here. One would be proliferation of the compounds, and the other one would be survival. 
and we determined in other experiments that about um, 40 to 50 percent of the cells die within the first seven days. So we took each of these collections of um, 10 compounds and we put them into two mice each and these are the results um, of these studies so far and what we found were 10 pools that stimulated neurogenesis to our uh, predetermined threshold level which is shown here with this line. And the next step then was to take these pools of compounds and break them down into their individual components and see which of those 10 compounds, if any, was responsible for allowing the, enabling the brain to make new neurons. So we did that with each of the 10 groups. And this is what we found, uh, this is an example of what we found in each group. And this happens to be uh, the third compound in pool seven, which we discovered is the compound that was responsible for neurogenesis. The rest of the compounds in that pool, when infused individually into mice, had no effect whatsoever. So we have a total now of eight small molecules that can be used in a living mouse to stimulate neurogenesis. And we've done most of our preliminary work with this particular molecule called P7C3 for pool seven compound three, because it has some really favorable characteristics that we just got really lucky on where it potently crosses the blood-brain barrier, and so we can administer it orally rather than having to put it directly into the brain. And that way, we're able to give it to the mouse for a very long period of time and really study the effect of augmenting neurogenesis over the lifespan of the mouse. And that's what we did here. These are just general morphological pictures of the structure of the hippocampus in wild-type mice and NPAS3 deficient mice. Normally, you see a lot of um, neurons that extend dendrites out into this upper layer, and it's, it's a nice, thick, dentate gyrus layer. The NPAS3 knockout mouse not only has a thinner, more poorly formed layer, but the neurons themselves are poorly formed. They don't make as many communications with other neurons, so they're not operating within that circuit properly. But when we give this particular mouse our compound orally for about um, three months of time, what we see is that the structure of the hippocampus gets completely restored. The thickness gets put back to normal, and the branching and the length of the dendrites becomes um, back to normal as well. And so we're currently doing a lot of behavioral testing with this compound to see if we can fix any of the learning deficits that these mice have. And we've also done some electrophysiologic testing and shown that a deficit that we see in this circuit leading from the cortex into the dentate gyrus that we see in the knockout mouse also gets completely fixed when the knockout mouse is given this drug. So that's, um, well, we consider that pretty hopeful that we may be able to translate that into uh, behavioral effects as well. So we're, we're doing that, and we're also executing a whole program to try to find the molecular targets of P7C3 so that we can potentially open up a brand new way of regulating this process. And then we have the other eight molecules that we're looking at, seven molecules that we're looking at as well. And so I just want to thank everybody who's helped it. This actually is not a fully complete list, but I want to point out Steve McKnight, who um, has been very, very supportive of this project 